Hello, it's Scott Manley here. So, after my video about Martian dreams, some people were interested in the rich history of exploring space by firing things from really large guns. So just what would it take to make this concept work? Well, the first appearance of the idea is probably Newton's cannonball in his book A Treatise on the System of the World from 1728. Although in this context it was more a thought experiment regarding gravity, he wasn't seriously proposing launching things into orbit by means of a cannon. But he did point out that without further adjustments the cannonball would orbit around the world and eventually return to its starting point, effectively shooting the cannoneers in the back. Now, in the context of fiction, the most famous representation of a space gun is probably in Jules Verne's novel From the Earth to the Moon, in which the astronauts fly to the moon using a ship launched from a cannon. And a similar example is found in his contemporary H.G. Wells, the hydrogen accelerators used by the Martians to launch their invasion in the War of the Worlds uses a similar concept. In 1936, Mr. Wells would also use this concept of a space gun to launch people to the moon in the movie Things to Come. Although by this point, I would expect he got a few strongly worded letters from members of the fledgling rocket science community pointing out the ridiculousness of the concept. So let's do some mathematics to figure out the forces on a spacecraft being launched from a cannon. In a fairly crude model, you can imagine that the projectile is being accelerated at a constant rate along the gun barrel, and then as soon as it leaves the barrel, the acceleration stops. So, this velocity versus time graph represents constant acceleration. Now, velocity is a measure of distance covered over time. That's why we say things like miles per hour or meters per second. So, get to get the distance, covered by this projectile accelerating at a constant rate, we need to compute the area under the graph, which is a triangle. So it's half the base times the height, or d equals a half v times t. Now, acceleration is the change in velocity over time. So that means that acceleration is equal to v velocity divided by time, t. So if we take these and we rearrange these two equations together, we get that the acceleration required is equal to half of velocity squared divided by d, where d is the length of the barrel. So for a given target velocity and barrel length, we can figure out the acceleration. And, well, the numbers are not pretty. Imagine we want to launch a projectile up to Earth's escape velocity, 11.2 kilometers per second. That means that for a 100 meter gun barrel, the acceleration is 64,000 Gs. Oh, ouch. Now, now the required acceleration value does drop linearly as the barrel gets longer. So if you were to take that 100 meter barrel and make it a 100 kilometer barrel, you would only require an acceleration of 64 G. Now that is a lot lower, but it is still going to be fatal to any humans for the amount of time taken to accelerate. Now, if we want to bring the accelerations down to something which would be tolerable to humans, then you're looking at something like a 500 kilometer barrel, which would produce an acceleration of 12.8 Gs, which is tolerable for extended periods for humans lying on their backs. Perhaps there are ways to make the human body more robust against really high g-forces. For example, some people suggest immersing the body in a liquid with a density close to that of the human body, and that would support the body and protect it, assuming you can keep air flowing into those lungs. But seriously, this is unlikely to happen. However, you could easily imagine building a hardened automated spacecraft capable of handling thousands of g's, Electronics in artillery shells are apparently rated to something like 15,000 Gs, and even those plain old shockproof wristwatches, those will handle up to 5,000. Actually accelerating a projectile up to 11 kilometers per second requires more than a plain old cannon. You see, in a low-tech gun, the propellant explodes and the gases released in the combustion push the projectile down the barrel. 
Now this is good up to a few times the speed of sound, but as you try to go faster, you end up running into all sorts of technical issues, which have been solved in a variety of interesting ways by experimental high velocity gun designs. Now the first problem that you run into, literally, is that the air in the barrel in front of the projectile actually will resist the acceleration because it cannot get out of the way. Right, It is constrained in a barrel and it can't slide around the outside. So the propellant not only has to push the mass of the projectile, it also has to push, push the mass of the air. And over long barrels, this becomes hugely significant. So super high velocity guns would actually use an evacuated barrel, a vacuum, with a seal over the end that would be strong enough to stop the air getting back in. And yet that seal would have to be weak enough to not significantly impede the passage of the projectile through it. Alternatively, some speculative gun designs are so long that the end of the barrel actually ends up several kilometers up. At this altitude, the atmosphere is practically a vacuum and does not drain into the barrel quickly enough to be a significant problem. Now the next problem is that the hot gases that are driving the projectile, they have their own speed of sound. The energetic gases have a finite velocity that's maybe, you know, a few kilometers per second at most. It's impossible to accelerate a projectile beyond the speed of sound of the propellant gases, or it becomes largely inefficient. And this essentially provides an upper limit. Now, instead of using a standard gun propellant, you can use you know, fancier mixtures. You can use a mixture more like rocket fuel, say hydrogen and oxygen, and these will get your propellant speeds up to about four kilometers per second. That's still a long way short of what you actually need. But then you can go even faster using something called a light gas gun. You see, the combustion products are typically things like carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, or in the case of hydrogen and oxygen combustion, you get water. Now, these are molecules and they have molecular masses. And if you know uh, anything about gas laws, you know that the pressure is actually provided by the particles or the atoms flying around at very high speeds. You'll also know that as the particles get lighter, as the atoms get lighter, the velocities get higher for the same pressure. So if you can take the carbon dioxide and replace it with something really light, say hydrogen or helium, then you get a much higher speed of sound at the same pressure. And this is why, you know, helium makes your voice squeaky because a higher speed of sound in helium means higher oscillation rates in your voice box. So. If we can propel the projectile with the lightest gas possible, we can get even higher velocities. Instead of burning that hydrogen, we can compress it with a piston, rather like an air gun. But this piston is in fact another projectile in another gun, with the propellant, a conventional propellant, pushing it forwards, compressing a hydrogen reservoir, and then this hydrogen itself drives the actual projectile. There are even some designs that take the hydrogen reservoir and use microwaves to heat up the hydrogen first and therefore increase its uh, speed of sound even more. Now the first stage gun and projectile are typically much more massive than the actual projectile that we're launching. The trick in this system is to take the energy of a big, heavy, slow moving object and transfer it to a lighter object that ends up moving many times faster. And NASA actually uses small versions of these light gas guns to fire test projectiles at speeds of up to seven kilometers per second. So that's already in the vicinity of orbital velocity. Now at this point, I want to take a moment to reconsider those acceleration calculations I came up with earlier. I had assumed constant acceleration along the barrel. And this is an approximation which is way wide of the mark. You see, as a propellant pushes the projectile down the barrel, it expands and in so doing its pressure drops and therefore so does the acceleration. There's actually a couple of interesting gun designs which remedy this in, to a certain extent. One idea is the blast wave accelerator, which is like the chemical explosive version of an electromagnetic coil gun, right? The idea is that as the projectile travels down the barrel, you detonate more explosives to keep the pressure up. Uh, therefore, the pressure wave remains high, 
and the projectile essentially surfs this ongoing explosion down the barrel. In fact, the blast wave designs can theoretically propel the projectile beyond the speed of sound of the propellant. What you do is you taper the end of the projectile so that as the detonation happens, it squeezes the end of the projectile and it slides forward. Much like if you were to take an apple seed and squeeze it between your fingers and you watch it shoot off faster than your fingers are moving. Now imagine that apple seed moving down a barrel and being squeezed by well-timed explosives. Now there's another way to get these speeds, which is my personal favorite. I think it merits a mention simply because it is so darn cool. Instead of evacuating the barrel in front of the projectile, you can instead fill it with a combustible gas mixture, say hydrogen and oxygen. Then you have a first stage gun, a light gas gun that fires a specially shaped projectile into this volatile mixture. Now the special shape has channels in it. Channels that are designed to act like ramjets. As they travel through, they generate shock waves and the combustion happens inside these channels and the whole thing accelerates down the barrel, essentially a ramjet powered projectile feeding off this specially tuned mixture of gases. Depending upon the regime, this could be called a ram accelerator or even a scram cannon. And actually by using multiple barrel sections containing tuned propellant mixtures, you can certainly get projectiles up to orbital velocities, at least in theory. Beyond this, we leave the realm of chemical explosives. There are, of course, a whole bunch of proposals that use electromagnetic accelerators, either a rail gun or a coil gun. They're not constrained by chemical reaction physics, but they have their own problems with powering them, and they're probably worth discussing in another video. And yes, I know I'm going to get a mention of this. There is that nuclear test that was a little bigger than they expected and it blew the steel manhole cover off the test shaft so fast that it was never found and the photographic evidence suggests that it may have in fact exceeded escape velocity. And so assuming you can get the projectiles up to speed you still have a few minor complications. Depending upon your design the end of the barrel may still be deep inside the Earth's atmosphere so as soon as you leave it you're going to have to contend with re-entry style fireballs on your ascent into space. And once there of course you need some sort of rocket to adjust your projectile into a stable orbit. But look Despite the formidable technical barriers, it's not completely beyond the scope of imagination that this might be a viable cheap launch mechanism at some point in the future. In the 1960s, there was something called Project HARP. That was the High Altitude Research Project. It was able to fire projectiles over 100 miles high using a 40 meter gun. That project eventually got cancelled. And then a decade later, the lead developer, a certain Gerald Bull, eventually, after a run-in with uh, jail, ended up working on Project Babylon, an even larger gun, which would have been 150 metres long. Unfortunately to do it for him, the Iraqi government of Saddam Hussein were the people funding it. And, uh, well, he also helped them with some missile technology. And in, on March 20th, 1990, he was assassinated and the gun sections were later seized by customs, so the gun was never assembled. Around about the same time, Project SHARP, the super high altitude research project, became the true successor to HARP, and it used a light gas gun design. It had a one ton piston driven by a methane oxygen propellant, and this would compress the hydrogen reservoir, and that in turn would transfer the energy to a five kilogram projectile. It was achieving three kilometers per second, but it was never elevated to fire it up into the air vertically. The project was expected to be able to launch projectiles at about 7 kilometers per second, but funding was never forthcoming. Later on, this would actually be used to test prototype scramjet designs by firing models at about Mach 9, which is apparently easier to do that than it is to build a wind tunnel that runs at those speeds. But today there are still people seriously working on the space gun concept. People like Quick Launch Incorporated who are proposing a light gas gun suspended in the ocean as an economically viable launch technology. On paper it would be cheaper than conventional launch systems, assuming you can overcome 
all the myriad problems. Anyway, I'm going to leave it there. I hope you've enjoyed this. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.